books, they're good for you, right? I mean, they make you smarter, and smarter is usually a good thing. At least some books make you smarter. Maybe some of those celebrity biographies could actually end up making you a little stupider. But they're never dangerous, right? Wrong. Some books are terrifying and even cursed. From the book that inspired the Cthulhu legend to the cursed book from Japan, here's 20 scary books that are too cursed to read. <sighs> Number 20. Necronomicon According to legend, the Necronomicon was written by a crazy Arabian poet named Abdul Al-Hazrad after a decade spent wandering the ruins of Babylon and Memphis. After completing the Al-Azif, Al-Hazrad fell farther into insanity before either vanishing or being consumed by an unseen monster, depending on who you believe. Following that, this terrifying text was translated into Greek by scholars in the 10th century, burnt in the Middle Ages, and the last few extant copies vanished into dusty libraries, only to be unearthed in the modern day by an illustrious few. Nobody in the world can read this book, and here's why. The Necronomicon really had a far shorter history than its genuine author, H.P. Lovecraft, led his readers to think. Although influenced by actual books like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Necronomicon was a creation of Lovecraft's fertile imagination, and it was first mentioned in the short story story The Hound, which was published in 1924. The story tells of two tomb thieves who were cursed by the thief of a jade amulet that they recognized as the thing hinted at in the forbidden Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Al-Hazrat. When Lovecraft died in 1937, he was mostly unknown outside of the loyal fans of the pulp fiction journals that published his works. His fiction was not generally read until decades after his death, when it was released in book form. As Lovecraft's reputation increased, so did the uncanny effect of the Necronomicon. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Tomino's Hell. This is a well-known Japanese story about a poem called Tomino's Hell. They say you should only read it in your head and never aloud. If you read it aloud, you must accept responsibility for what happens next. This tale was highly popular on 2chan, and many users took photographs and videos as proof and posted them on 2chan. Numerous people claimed that nothing happened. However, there were also many posts in which the person did not return to publish the findings. It's scary in my opinion, than someone stating that someone else got sick or died. When you think about it, that silence. Creepy. However, if you're going to read it aloud, read it in Japanese rather than the translation. Any country with a vast history and widespread continuous mythology that stretches back into the shadows of time is certain to have its fair share of eerie tales, and Japan fits the bill well. There is a long and rich history of both recorded and oral traditions, chronicling all kinds kinds of stories about spirits, gods, ghosts, demons, curses, and everything in between. The most strange stories, however, are those that not only tell of curses, but appear to be cursed themselves. Number 18. The Devil's Bible the book, Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible, is housed at the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm and is said to have been composed in a single night with the help of the devil and it is also the world's biggest manuscript. Codex Gigas is fashioned from more than 160 animal skins and is so hefty that it requires at least two people to move it. This Devil's Book is about 9 inches thick and 36 inches in height. In the 13th century, AD, the Codex Gigas was written in Latin and comprised pages of several Christian texts, including a complete edition of the Vulgate Bible, which subsequently became the Catholic Church's official Latin translation. However, the authorship of this work remains uncertain. It is stated that before being condemned to death, one monk swore to write a book containing all of human knowledge in a single night, but when midnight neared, the monk was unable to complete it, so he requested Lucifer a system by surrendering his soul in return for finishing the book. Lucifer approved and signed the book with a flamboyant self-portrait of himself. 
Number 17. Sorrows of Young Werther The Sorrows of Young Werther, one of the most renowned and controversial works in literary history, was Goethe's first work of narrative fiction published in 1774. The novel arrived perfectly for the zeitgeist, grabbing the European imagination with its depiction of a dangerously sensitive adolescent driven to suicide. It was an instant success, launching a new literary genre called Sturm und Drang, meaning storm and stress, as well as Goethe's career as the modern West's first literary celebrity. The novel was a phenomenon at the time, inspiring works such as Massenet's opera Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, in which the monster learns to be human by reading Werther, and Ulrich Plensdorff's 1973 novel, The New Sufferings of Young W. It not only contributed to the development of romanticism, but it also gave a lexicon for teenage upheaval that has remained with us to this day. Without Werther, there could be no catcher in the rye or rebel without a cause. Young men began to dress in yellow pants and blue jackets to imitate the doomed main character soon after its publication in 1774. After being rejected by the lady he loves, Werther kills himself with a pistol in the novel, and immediately after its publication, there were tales of young men employing the same way to commit suicide in acts of hopelessness. The Werther Effect, named after Goethe's masterpiece The Sorrows of Young Werther, refers to an increase in emulation suicides following a publicly publicized suicide. Suicides can spread across a school system, a neighborhood, or in the case of a celebrity suicide wave, throughout the country. Number 16. The Story of the Vivian Girls in 1973, a tremendous, thorough, spooky discovery was made in Chicago. Nathan Lerner, a photographer and designer, had an elderly tenant named Henry Darger. Darger moved into an old people's home and died six months later. Lerner prepared to empty his room when he saw a mound of writings, images, and documents heaped high all around him. Henry Darger had led a solitary existence as a kid he was orphaned and hospitalized, and he found menial work in Chicago hospitals. He he only had one friend, a man who later moved away from Chicago, and spent the most of his free time alone in his room. Darger began to construct a gigantic fantasy world to compensate for a daily existence of loneliness and insignificance, and no doubt as a result of his own childhood tragedies. In approximately 1910, he began work on a gigantic novel centered on war and the sufferings of innocent children. The story of the Vivian girls in what is known as the realms of the unreal of the Glen Deco Angel and War Tempest, provoked by the Child Slave Rebellion. The title's length mirrors the book's eventual length, 15 volumes totaling over 15,000 neatly typed pages. The book was filled with extraordinarily detailed and explicit depictions of bloody battles, tortures, and executions. The victims were virtually entirely kid slave rebels, while the offenders were adult male Glendalinia troops, the forces of good, headed by the Christian kingdom of Abiania, and the heroes, the Seven beautiful and heroic Vivian sisters were eventually rewarded with victory, but not without terrible suffering. Number 15. Prophecies of Nostradamus Michel de Nostradamus, known as Nostradamus in Latin and in English, was a French astronomer, physician, and supposed seer best known for his book Les Prophéties, published in 1555. A compilation of 942 poetic quatrains allegedly forecasting future events, Nostradamus's father's family had been Jewish until converting to Catholicism a generation before Nostradamus was born. He studied at the University of Avignon known for a year before being forced to leave, when the university closed due to a plague outbreak. In the years after the release of his Les Prophéties, Notre Dame has gained numerous followers, including much of the popular press, who credited him with properly forecasting many key international events. Academic sources deny that Notre Dame has true supernatural predictive talents, claiming that the links drawn between global events and Notre Dame's quatrains are the 
consequence of misinterpretations or mistranslations, sometimes deliberate. These experts also contend that Notre Dame's prophecies are notoriously ambiguous, implying that they might be applied to almost anything, and are thus unhelpful in assessing whether their authority has genuine prophetic skills. Many followers of Nostradamus think his prophecies are true. However, because these interpretations are subjective, no two of them totally agree on what Notre Dame is foretold, whether for the past or the future. However, many admirers agree that he foretold the Great Fire of London, the French Revolution, the rising of Napoleon, and Adolf Hitler, both world wars, and the nuclear annihilation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's a pretty impressive piece of clairvoyance. Number 14. Codex Mendoza the Codex Mendoza is an Aztec codex said to have been composed about 1541. It includes a history of the Aztec monarchs and their conquests, as well as a depiction of pre-conquest Aztec society's daily life. The codex is written in Nahuatl, with typical Aztec pictograms, and includes a translation and explanation of the content in Spanish. It was named after Don Antonio de Mendoza, the viceroy of New Spain and a major patron of indigenous artists. Mendoza was well aware that the conquest's atrocities had destroyed several native items, as well as the artisan traditions that produced them. When the Spanish crown ordered Mendoza to provide evidence of the Aztec political and tribute system, he invited skilled artists and scribes from the Franciscan College in Tlatelolca to gather in a workshop where they could recreate the document for himself and the King of Spain under the supervision of Spanish priests. They created a visual manuscript, known as the Codex Mendoza, which consists of 71 folios made of Spanish paper. The manuscript is written in the local form, and is now bound at the spine like a European book. Number 13. The Book of Soiga the Book of Soiga, commonly known as Aldaraya, is a demonology work published in Latin in the early 16th century. The creator of this intriguing work is unknown, but it is known that John Dee, a distinguished English astronomer, mathematician, and occult philosopher, who served as a counselor to Elizabeth I, obtained it in the early 1580s and spent the rest of his life attempting to unravel its mysteries. Dee was able to read the majority of the book very simply since it was written in ordinary Latin, and he rapidly became absorbed in paragraphs that described conjurations, protective spells, perplexing magical formulas, and hierarchies of angels and devils. The committed researcher, however, was never able to read the book's final 36 pages, which include tables filled with strange Latin letters. He concluded the tables included a coded message, but after using some severe and unconventional approaches, he was unable to decipher its meaning. After Dee's death, in the late 60s, 1610s, the Book of Sagia vanished. Its name appears in several historical documents, but most historians and occultists assumed it had been destroyed or lost forever. Surprisingly, over 400 years after Dee's death, a copy of the book was discovered among heaps of other dusty antique volumes at London's British Library, the world's biggest library. As soon as it was revealed that the Book of Sagia had been discovered, cryptographers and esoteric enthusiasts rushed to interpret the significance of its final 36 pages. Unlike the mystique surrounding the mystery book, cryptographer Jim Reads is still alive 12 years after cracking the book's code. However, just because he read the pages doesn't imply he correctly interpreted them, and only those who do are purportedly destined to become the victims of the book's curse. Number 12. Voynich Manuscript the Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex written in an unknown writing style, known as Voynichese. The vellum on which it is written is carbon dated to the early 15th century, and stylistic analysis suggests it was written in Italy during the Italian Renaissance. The manuscript's origins, authorship, and purpose are all being questioned. Several possibilities have been advanced, including the possibility that it is an otherwise unrecorded script for a natural or created language, an unread code cipher or other type of encryption, or just a pointless prank. 
The text is now roughly 240 pages long, although there is indications that more pages are missing. Some pages are made up of foldable sheets of varied sizes. The majority of the pages include imaginative pictures or schematics, some of which are badly stained, with portions of the manuscript depicting people, imaginary vegetation, astrological symbols, and so on. Wilfred Voynich, a Polish book merchant who bought it in 1912, is commemorated by the manuscript's name. It has been housed in Yale University's Bainek Rare Book and Manuscript Library since 1969. Many professional and amateur cryptographers, including American and British codebreakers from both world wars, have examined the Voynich manuscript. The document has never been decoded, and none of the several ideas presented over the last century have been objectively validated. The enigma of its meaning and origin has piqued the public's interest, prompting research and discussion. Number 11. The Great Omar Sengorsky and Sutcliffe is a well-known bookbinding company. They were founded in London in 1901 and are most renowned for their gorgeous bindings. Their most renowned work was The Great Omar, a copy of Omar Khayyam's The Rubaiyat, commissioned by Sotheran's Bookshop in a project where the cost of the book was not a factor. They outdid all past efforts with that free reign. Sengorsky and Sutcliffe spent two and a half years creating a magnificent binding with over a thousand gems, the front cover featured three golden peacocks with inlaid gems and gold tails, as well as vines twisting around them. When the book was finished in 1911, it was priced at 1,000 pounds and transported to New York for exhibition. The problem started when customs sought a high tax on the consignment, which Sotherins refused to pay. The Great Omar was returned to England where Sotherins had it auctioned off at Sothersby's. It sold for 450 pounds to an American called Gabriel Wells less than half of its initial reserve price. The first ship, meant to transfer the Great Omar departed without the book, so it was safely placed aboard the Titanic, an unsinkable luxury liner just to be extra safe. Do I need to tell you how that panned out? In April 1912, the book went down with the ship. A few weeks later, a distraught Sankorsky drowned while attempting to save a drowning woman. This is one cursed book. Sankorsky and Sutcliffe Sutcliffe carried on following Sengorsky's death. Sutcliffe made a duplicate of the Great Omar to replace the original. As soon as it was finished, it was secured in a bank vault. Unfortunately, the bank, vault, and book were all destroyed during World War II bombardment. In 1936, Sutcliffe's nephew, Stanley Bray, took over the company. Stanley built the third Great Omar to his uncle's original specs when he retired. This final copy is still housed at the British Library. Number 10. The Grand Grimoire the Grand Grimoire is one of the most frightening and lethal occult publications ever written. It was allegedly composed in the 16th century by a man cursed by the devil. As a result, this book is also known as the Gospel of Satan. This book is filled with terrible secrets that may teach readers how to call great demons or horrors, as well as how to resurrect the dead. However, everything in this reality has a cost, and everyone who reads or follows the terrible steps of Grand Grimoire is directly selling his soul to the demon. As a as a result, the original manuscript is deemed exceedingly hazardous and has been hidden someplace in the Vatican's secret vaults, the location of which is only known to a few priests, who examine the books on a daily basis and shower it with holy water to dispel demon powers. This book, also known as Le Dragon Rouge, or The Red Dragon, includes directions for summoning Lucifer, or Lucifuge Rofocal, in order to make a deal with the devil. There are two books in the work. The first book offers directions for summoning a demon and building equipment to force the demon to fulfill one's will. The second volume is divided into two sections, Sanctum Regnum and Secrets of the Magic Art of the Grand Grimoire. Number 9. The Catcher in the Rye one of the most well-known American novels of the 20th century is The Catcher in the Rye. In this work, J.D. Salinger manages to capture the spirit of youth. Despite initially negative reviews, readers loved it. It became the literary masterpiece that best depicts adolescence. Its straightforward language mirrors reality. It was nevertheless quite contentious when it was originally published in 1951. Because of its popularity and the evil that surrounds it, this work has left a significant 
legacy, ranging from urban legend to songs inspired by this cursed book. This is a must-read for teenagers. Other names that come to mind when discussing this work include Robert John Bardo and John Hinckley. Hinckley attempted to assassinate Ronald Reagan while Bardo murdered young actress Rebecca Schaefer. They were both holding a copy of The Catcher in the Rye. Mark David Chapman, a John Lennon fan who saw Lennon as one of those youngsters falling into the abyss depicted by Holden Caulfield, assassinated him. Chapman felt that by killing him, he would spare him from the world's turmoils, enabling his innocence to endure. Chapman read The Catcher in the Rye until the cops arrived after committing the crime. He had written, My Confession, in the book and signed it, Holden Caulfield. Number 8. The Orphan Story a lost and allegedly cursed Golden Age epic recounting the beauty, excitement, and brutality of Spain's imperial power has been published for the first time 400 years after it was written. Historia del Huerfano, or The Orphan Story, follows the journey of a 14-year-old Spaniard who leaves Granada to seek his fortune in the Americas. Its hero travels across the Spanish Empire from the high society fiestas of Lima to the mephitic mines of Potosí and witnesses Sir Francis Drake's invasion on Puerto Rico and the fall of Cadiz. After love, adventures, a shipwreck, and a run-in with pirates, the soldier missionary ultimately gets to accept the serenity of monastic life in Peru's capital, Martin de Leon y Cardenas, a Spanish Augustinian priest born near Malaga in 1584, and who, like his titular hero, had traveled to Lima, wrote the narrative between 1608 and 1615. It was scheduled to be published in 1621 under the pen name Andres de Leon, but it never saw the light of day, possibly because its author feared it would cause him problems as he embarked on an ecclesiastical career that would see him become an archbishop, president, and captain general of the Vice Royalty of Sicily. In 1965, a Spanish professor uncovered the manuscript in the Hispanic Society of America archives. Previous attempts to publish the orphan story had failed, giving rise to rumors that something sinister lay behind its 328 pages. Number 7. The Lesser Key of Solomon the Lesser Key of Solomon is a demonology grimoire written by an unknown author. It was assembled in the mid-17th century, largely from sources that were several centuries older. The invocation of demons or bad spirits is referred to as Goetia in Latin. Goetia was typically regarded bad and heretical in medieval and Renaissance Europe. In contrast to Theria, Theurgy, and Magia Naturalis, natural magic, which were a occasionally considered more honorable. This section of the work was later translated and published by Aleister Crowley in 1904 under the title The Book of the Goetia of Solomon the King by Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers. Crowley included numerous previously unconnected invocations as well as articles defining the rituals as psychological study rather than demon summoning. The demons are commanded by four cardinal kings, Emaemon, Corson, Ziminimar, and Gap. The majority of the summoned spirits are related to compass points, four emperors are tied to cardinal points, Carnesiel in the east, Amenadiel in the west, Demoriel in the north, and Caspiel in the south, while six dukes are tied to intercardinal points and other directions between them. There are also eleven wandering princes for a total of thirty-one spirit leaders, each of whom rules over a few dozen spirits. Number 6. The Untitled Grimoires these papers include Persephone's witchy past, which she modified throughout her adult life, including her mother's grimoire. The first volume is around 250 pages long, and contains spells, incantations, curses, and enchantments, as well as information on stones, planets, ceremonies, potions, and even exorcisms. The second volume contains recipes for alchemy and chemistry, treatments, perfume and balms, nerve tonics, and even 
Hairspray. Because Persephone's spells are regarded in Wiccan tradition to hold greater power than most other records due to her embodiment of them, the first book is said to bear the curse, heavier than its counterpart. Persephone is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter in Greek mythology after her abduction by Hades, the god of the underworld, and with the agreement of Zeus, her father slash uncle, she became queen of the underworld and brother-in-law after her marriage to Hades, her abduction, sojourn in the underworld, and temporary return to the surface symbolize her functions as the embodiment of spring and the personification of vegetation, particularly grain crops, which disappear into the earth when sown, sprout from the earth in spring, and are harvested when fully grown. Persephone is always shown robed and bearing a sheaf of wheat in classic Greek art. She may appear as a mysterious deity with a scepter and a little box, although she was typically shown as being taken away by Hades. Number 5. Kingdom of the Cursed Amelia journeys to the Seven Circles with the intriguing Prince of Wrath after selling her soul to become Queen of the Wicked, where she is introduced to a fascinating realm of immorality. She swears to go to whatever length to revenge her beloved sister, Vittoria, even if it means taking the hand of the Prince of Pride, the Demon Ruler. This is the book known as Kingdom of the Cursed. The first rule is the Wicked's Court. Nobody should be trusted. Amelia is more alone than ever before. Thanks to backstabbing princes, magnificent mansions, cryptic party invites, and contradicting evidence about who killed her twin. She can even trust Wrath, her former mortal comrade, or is he hiding terrible truths about his actual nature? Amelia will be put to the test in every manner, as she seeks a succession of magical artifacts that will reveal her history and provide the answers she wants. Number 4. House of Leaves House of Leaves is the debut novel of American novelist Mark C. Danielewski, released by Pantheon Books in March 2000. It is a bestseller that has been translated into several languages and is followed by The Whale Stow Letters, a companion work. The narrative revolves around a fictitious documentary about a family whose home includes an apparently infinite labyrinth. House of Leaves format and structure are odd, with distinctive page layout and design. It has several footnotes Notes, many of which are footnotes in and of themselves, including references to imaginary books, films, or articles. Some pages, on the other hand, feature only a few words or lines of text, organized in unexpected ways to match the events in the tale, frequently creating an agoraphobic and claustrophobic feel. The book must be turned at times to be read. The work is particularly notable for its numerous narrators who interact in intricate and bewildering ways. Number 3. The Book of Abramelin when Aleister Crowley was developing his magic system around the turn of the century, he went to the system of Abramelin of Egypt for essentials. From Abramelin, he refined his conceptions of safeguards, purifications, evocations, garments, and dramana. Abramelin, the mage's method, is known through a remarkable 15th century book preserved in Paris's Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal. In it, Abraham of Wurzburg, a Kabbalist and connoisseur of magics, chronicles a trip of the then-civilized globe, visiting sorcerers, magicians, and Kabbalists, and assessing their abilities and virtues. The high point of Abraham's journey was located in a little village on the banks of the Nile, where he met the famous magician Abramelin, whose whole system Abraham then details. This corresponds to the whole education in ceremonial magic, both white and black, which the learner can follow alone. Number 2. The Codex Seraphinianus Fish eyes from some strange species float on the sea's surface, peering at me. A guy rides in his own coffin. These bizarre visuals are accompanied by handwritten text that appears to be old yet is completely incomprehensible. You've just entered the unusual realm of Codex Seraphinianus, the world's strangest encyclopedia. Codex Seraphinianus is 300 pages of descriptions and explanations for an imagined existence, all written in its own unique alphabet, with hundreds of 
pictures and graphs. It was initially published in 1981 by publisher Franco Maria Risi and has been a collector's choice for years before seeing a sudden surge in popularity due to a rising following on the internet. Now, a revised version from Italian publisher Rizzoli is set to hit stores on October 29th, with 3,000 pre-ordered copies having sold out. The Codex has a new generation of followers, individuals who grew up using the internet and are ready to discover the intriguing and relentless world outside, which is as odd as it is represented in the book. Luigi Serafini, born in Rome in 1949, is an Italian architect turned artist who has also worked in industrial design, painting, illustration, and sculpture, collaborating with some of Europe's most important personalities. Roland Barthes eagerly agreed to write the book's prologue, but following his untimely death, the option fell to Italio Calvino, who referenced it in his essay collection, Collezione di Sabia. Another fan was Italian filmmaker Federico Fellini, who accepted Serafini's offer of drawings for his final film, La Voce della Luna. Number 1. Grimorium Verum the Grimorium Verum, Latin meaning true grimoire, is an 18th century grimoire credited to Memphis's Alabek the Egyptian, who allegedly composed in 1517. It, like many grimoires, purports to be a continuation of King Solomon's heritage. The grimoire is not a translation of an older text, as claimed with the original appearing in French or Italian in the mid-18th century, as stated by A. E. Waite in his The Book of Ceremonial Magic. The date specifies in the title of the Grimorium Verum is undeniably fraudulent. The work belongs to the middle of the 18th century, and Memphis is Rome. One version of the grimoire was included as the Clavicles of King Solomon, Book 3, in one of the French manuscripts adopted by S. L. McGregor Mathers in his version of the Key of Solomon, but it was excluded from the key. Maybe it was just too darn scary. Would you dare read any of these books? What's the most dangerous book you can think of? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!